Welcome back to our continued set of vignettes on scaling. So in this vignette, I'm going to try and attack one particular question, which has to do with the scaling of cellular structures. And the, the one in particular that we're going to think about is the nucleolus. But prior to doing that, I want to just give a little bit of an indication of some of the things that people have been thinking about with respect to these questions of scaling. I think it's very, very interesting and important. And you know these kinds of empirical insights are exactly what I mean when I say quantitative data demands quantitative models. I don't think that one can stand by and just say, "Ho oh, hum, you know that thing scales like that other thing." I think it demands some sort of an explanation. And when I when I say demands an explanation, I mean it in the context of of the use of the words "account for" that we heard about uh, from Schrodinger's "What Is Life." So what's shown here in parts A and B is the relationship between the nuclear size and the size of cells. So that's cool. This is for uh, the, the fission yeast, uh, Pombi. Uh, and what I want you to get out of it is just to note on the left, there are some microscopy images. And on the right is the plot of the correlation between nuclear size on the y-axis and cell size shown on the x-axis. So mm -hmm. great. The, the next example has to do with the uh, spindle and You'll recall that the spindle is the apparatus that segregates chromosomes in dividing cells. Um, and in this case, there's been very beautiful work that I hope and think that we'll come back to later, where people have explored the question of how the, the spindle size scales with the size of the nucleus as well. And you might say, well, you know, why would you even bother thinking about this? But let, let's think about embryogenesis. So if I, if I start with a frog egg and it is fertilized, what will happen is that there will be a series of cell divisions, but basically at fixed volume. And what that means is that progressively the cells are going to get smaller and smaller with increasing numbers of cell divisions. And interestingly, what's been observed is that the size of the spindle actually decreases as the as the cells themselves decrease in size. And so, you know, that, that's a great example of something that calls for an explanation. In the lower left, parts E and F, that has to do with the scaling of mitochondria and the mitochondrial size as a function of the cell size. And then the, uh, the lower right is, is another example. I think in that case, it's the centrosome. So, uh, so fine, that, that's all by way of introduction and all by way of background. And now what I want to do is I want to talk about a particular case study. And this is a good moment for me to introduce the so-called experiments to change your life for, which I always like to introduce. And I think it's very worth your while to think about. You know, I try to read on the order maybe of 150 papers each year, and I keep notes on each and every paper. And then at the end of the year, so this is it's January 2021 right now, so, um, so at this point, I just went through this exercise of reviewing last year's reading. And yet last year was a terrible year. It's the year of the pandemic, et cetera. But you know, what I'm always curious about is what fraction of the paper has really deeply moved me in some sense. And probably the best way to put this is, you know, an experiment to change your life for is, uh, I think, best illustrated when I go out in the world and I give a talk. And you know, the real pleasure of going around and giving talks is not giving the talk. That's the worst part of a given day. The best part is visiting with the students and the, and the other, uh, other people that are professors and hearing about what's going on in their groups. And so here, um, this is work that was done by Steph Weber when she was a postdoc with Cliff Brangwen. And you know, last year, one of the highlights of my year was to, uh, or maybe it was 2019, was to go to McGill and um, spend some time uh, visiting Steph and her group and, and their department. And so at any rate, this it qualifies as an experiment to change your life for in the sense that after such a visit, you get on the airplane, you're getting ready to go home, and you think to yourself, wow, that thing that I learned about was so cool, I should work on that rather than on what I'm actually working on. And so I would put that this experiment in that category. You know, the, the kinds of case studies that I'm looking for in this course are case studies in which there's some fun phenomenon that matters biologically. There was some clever experiment that was done, and the experiment was done in a way such that there were graphs that were plotted that essentially tell us that the people doing the experiment had a hunch that there was some sort of 
either an empirical or well-known scaling between this, th this thing and the other thing, and it leaves in its wake a puzzle. And the puzzle permits us to do physical biology modeling in the spirit of what we've been slowly working our way up to thus far with these vignettes. And there are consequences to the, the model that comes out of that analysis. And so that's where we are. And what we're going to do is we're going to consider this paper, which you know I'd really like for you to read, inverse size scaling of the nucleolus by a concentration dependent phase transition. And so the, the paper is super interesting. and. The, the results are summarized basically here. So this is uh, experiments that were done in C. elegans, which is a small nematode worm, a classic model system. And what they did is they looked at the nucleolus, which you see, for example, in, the, in part A, especially the, the lower set of images. They looked at the nucleolus and its size as measured by fluorescence intensity and how it relates to the nuclear volume. There's actually a, uh, a, a typo, by the way, on the y-axis of part B. So I want to I want to make sure that you're aware of that. So this actually should say nucleolar. This is, uh, this is for our new book and uh, it's a mistake we haven't yet fixed. You'll see it's correct down here. Okay, so that's nucleolar uh, volume or nucleolar intensity. So they used a particular marker protein, which is associated with nucleoli, and I'm not going to go into any further detail, but basically they use the intensity of that protein as a readout of the size of the nucleolus. And I have two main results to call to your attention, and then we will try to reason them out. So on the upper right, part B, what they're showing us is that through these successive divisions, the nucleoli get smaller. So in other words, there seems to be a linear relationship between the nucleolar size and the nuclear volume. So that's result number one. Then, uh, oh, there's, a, there's another problem, which is, uh, sorry, I, I forgot that these issues were associated with this figure, so we're going to have to fix that. But this is backwards, so this is constant number. And this is constant concentration. And that's the crux of the whole matter. And, you know, like with many things in life, <laughs> you try hard, and you try hard, and still you come up short. So, you know, we try hard to get our figures right, and the, the, I've just shown you three mistakes in this uh, one figure, which, for which I apologize. It doesn't change the, the content. So at the top, uh, the, the hint is in the title, the constant concentration. So as the cells, as the, as the cells divide, the concentration of nucleolar proteins is constant. And so that means the total number of available pr proteins in the nucleus goes down with, as the size of the, the nuclei themselves get smaller. Now, in the bottom, part C, what Steph and Cliff did was a very clever thing. They found a way to basically um, to change the size of the, uh, the nucleus, if I remember correctly, using RNAi. I'm, Little, I, I, even though I read the paper last week, I've already, um, I've already forgotten some of the details. But the point is, for my purposes, that what they've really done is is maintain the number of nuclear proteins, but change the volume. And so now you've got a constant number situation. And in that case, what they find is that the nuclear size goes down with increasing volume. And it's those two effects that we want to try to explain now. So here's the, the basis of our pathetic thinking, to quote Jeremy Guna Wardena. Uh, we're going to imagine that there is the nucleus, and inside of the nucleus there is going to be uh, M of these GFP labeled uh, molecules that are associated with the, the nucleolus, and N of them, sorry, M, sorry, I said that wrong, M is the number of, of these green molecules present in the nucleolus. N is the total number of green molecules and uh, V is the volume of the nucleus. So I want to take this as my first opportunity to write down, uh, even though we're going to do this more formally later, but what I want to do is I want to write down the kinetics uh, of the nucleolar size. And what I really mean by that is I want to write down uh, M at time T plus delta T so this is the 
number of molecules in the nucleolus. at time t plus delta t. And that's going to be equal to the number of molecules in the nucleus OLS at time t. So let me just copy this. So now we just get rid of the plus delta t. And then uh, I'm going to say plus um, k on, and then that's going to be um, given by, uh, how do I want to write this? It's going to be given by the uh, total number minus the number that are associated already with the nucleolus. So what, let, let's think about what I just said. So what I'm saying is that there's a certain rate at which molecules are joining on to the nucleolus. And that rate constant is k on. So that's what I'm showing you here. So note up here that k on is this rate constant. It's telling me about the propensity of molecules to jump on to the nucleolus. And it's saying that uh, it's proportional to how many molecules are left in solution, if you'll let me use those words. So n minus m is the number of free nucleolar proteins. So this is the number of free nucleolar proteins, because m of them are already wrapped up. And then, so now we need to subtract off the the molecules that are part of the nucleolus that are falling, that are basically uh, freeing themselves and going back into solution. Uh, and all of this needs to be multiplied by delta t because these are, these are uh, rate constants. So k times delta t uh, ends up being unitless, which is what, what we were after. Um, well, okay, sorry, that was a little, a little sloppy. K on over V uh, times delta T uh, is, is going to have the, the right units. Um, okay, so, so what does this all imply? I can always rewrite this as M of T plus delta T minus M of T divided by delta T is equal to K on times N minus M divided by V minus K off. And you'll recall earlier I said, you know, this is, this is our discrete approximation to the rate of change of M. So basically what we have is we have a differential equation, a rate equation that describes the time evolution of M, which an M is the size of the nucleolus. It's the number for our purposes, it's the size because it's the number of molecules associated with the nucleolus. So our question now is, what, what's going on in steady state? So in steady state, first thing I can tell you is that in steady state, m at t plus delta t is equal to m of t. Those two things are equal, and so they will both be gone, and so at the end of the day, this thing has to be equal to zero. That's what we mean by steady state. So in steady state, the left-hand side is zero, that implies that k on times n minus m is equal to k off times v. So um, let's see. That tells me in turn that m is equal to um, k on over k off. Uh, I'm getting, I'm getting sloppy, to doing too many things in my head. Let me not do that. Let's let's try to rewrite this. So, um, so what I want to solve for is I want to solve for m. So, this leaves me with a k on n minus k off v is equal to k on m, and so this tells me that m 
is, and this is in steady state, is equal to n minus k off over k on times v, which I can finally write as n over v minus k off over k on times v, and I will also find it convenient to write that as c minus c star times v. So c star is the critical concentration, k off over k on, at which one will actually have a finite nucleolus. In other words, if the concentration is lower than c star, we won't have a nucleolus. If c is greater than c star, we, we will have a nucleolus. And what we see here is that, is that the, the result in the case at, in which c is fixed, so this is the first of the two experiments that I showed you, this one up here. In this case, the concentration of nucleolar proteins is constant through these reductive cell divisions. And so C minus C star is a constant. And it's a constant of proportionality times V, which tells me that uh, for fixed C, uh, M is proportional to V. So the, the, nucleal, the nucleolar size scales with V. So that, that was the first of the situations. Uh, the second situation was where they did the experiments in which n was the thing that was constant. All right. So if you look back to, so in this case, then we have m is equal to n over v minus c star times v. And what, what you should note in this case is that um, n is the thing that is constant. And so with increasing volume, the n over v becomes smaller. So uh, this, is, this is c effective. So c effective minus c star is getting smaller with increasing volume. And thus, uh, thus we find that the nuclear size decreases in those cases. In other words, if I, if I, if I look at a bunch of different scenarios where the, let's keep the volume the same, but we change the number. Um, oh, did I say that right? No, the way to say it is that the, um, is that the, the total number of nuclear proteins is constant, but then we look at different sizes. And what we find is that this C effective is therefore different. And so, um, so this prefactor will, will actually be different from one case to the next. So that corresponds to this situation. I think in uh, a homework, what I will do is I will have you estimate the parameters, for example, this slope now in this case, we can, it's a well-defined thing, and then we can also think about this slope as well. So let's just summarize what, what's happened here. So uh, I got a little tongue-tied at the end, but uh, the idea, just to reiterate, was that we have, um, we have a question of how the nucleolus scales with the nuclear size. We introduced the, we, because of the experiments done by Steph Weber and Cliff Brangwen, we introduced this idea that there were certain proteins that had been labeled and they allow us to read out the size. And then what I did is something that I'm going to do a number of times, and that is that I related the number now, uh, the number now to the number before, plus the number that are added minus the number that are subtracted. You know, this is a, basically an elementary balance law, which I already did in the context of exponential growth of the cell population. I'm using that same philosophy again here. Um, that led us to this differential equation, which I show you right here. And the next thing we did, which is very typical, but we at least have to do with wi eyes wide open, is we examined the steady state situation. And what we saw is that in steady state, this is the, how the nuclear size scales. 
So since in these reductive cell divisions, C, this quantity C, is constant. It's the number of nucleolar pr proteins uh, per unit volume, which doesn't have anything to do with the reductive divisions. And so as long as C is greater than C star, then this number is positive, and the nucleolar volume will scale with the volume of the nucleus. So that was, that was fine. And then we appealed to the second of the experiments that were done by Weber and Branglin. And, and in that case, they had a way of at keeping the number of nucleolar proteins the same, but changing the volume of the nucleus. And what that did is it effectively tuned this prefactor, this, uh, this what I'm calling C-effective. And the larger they made that volume, this volume, the smaller the concentration above C star and therefore the smaller the nucleolus. So that's the, that's the basic logic of, of um, what, the, what we wanted to report on. So this, this is the end for now of what I wanted to say about scaling ideas because they're going to permeate everything we do throughout the rest of the, the, the vignettes in this course. So this was really just to get acquainted with a particular example, and we're not done even with this nucleolus example either, because later we're going to spend some time thinking about phase separation. And this is a, an example, one of the canonical example, examples of phase separation in cells, which is, leads to the whole beautiful subject of membraneless organelles, which we'll think about further. So what we're going to do now is we're going to turn to the great probability distributions. Why probabilistic thinking is at the heart of cell biology or biology writ large and in much the same way the probabilistic thinking is at the heart of physics so we have to address the nature of the probability distributions for a whole host of different problems and what we're going to do now is just set the stage by talking about four key distributions the binomial distribution the poisson distribution the exponential distribution and the gaussian distribution with those in hand that will have laid the groundwork for the remainder of the course that's that's it for for uh, that